Welcome everyone to uh, V2, Lab for the Unstable Media. And uh, if you don't know who we are, uh, then you're welcome to check out our website. We uh, produce, publish, present, and archive research at the interface of art, technology, and uh, society. Uh, my job here is as community manager. Well, in many cases, that means the guy who runs Facebook. It does not in my case. It means I run the community. What does that mean? And uh, that means that I keep track of uh, fun people in our network, like Thomas and Kendall, uh, to see what they're up to and see how we can uh, work together to create something here at V2 that doesn't necessarily fit into our normal program, but definitely fits into our field and what we want to do here at V2. Um, so we work together, or I should give them all the credit, they all the work, to set up this evening tonight to kick off the launch of the uh, Dead Web Club. Uh, please welcome Thomas and Kendall to the stage with a nice warm applause. Uh, th thanks everyone for, for coming tonight. Uh, I'm Thomas, this is my uh, co-creator of Dead Web Club, Kendall. Um, uh, like the origin of this idea is to kind of create this meeting point between people interested in kind of online archives, online history, but also wants to create maybe something visual or interesting or research around it. Uh, I'm a v visual designer, or sometimes researcher. I'm really interested into like the social aspects of the web and, and technology. Um, and uh, maybe my, my friend Kendall will <laughs> tell more about herself. Hey, so uh, yeah, I'm Kendall. He kind of said that already, spoiler. Um, I am a PhD researcher in CSNI in London. Uh, so I'm doing research in internet communities, how they create art, stuff like this. And yeah, we both kind of came together over this whole social aspect of creating work online and also like, yeah, finding a space for people who maybe don't have that space yet. And then Thomas will tell you more. Uh, like two are kind of mutual kind of interests in this field. We both discovered there's uh, there, there's some kind of like uh, not too much communication between different groups who are all interested in the same topics, but maybe don't speak too much with each other. So we decided that maybe it will be a day to make a club where people can meet, communicate, share projects, research, or share ideas, uh, and and just share interests and talk about the same topic. The idea with that web club that we're not really, it's about learning from the past, but also acknowledge that we are in, in 2023 and not 1991. Uh, but with the web, we talk more than just, not just like say uh, MySpace era, we talk about everything from BBSs, IRC chats, email, HTML, 3D worlds that we'll see later in tonight. Uh, we also see, uh, you know, it, the, the topics of like alternative uh, web networks, kind of not just uh, PHP, you know, like uh, HTTP, but maybe other other formats. Um, and tonight we invited uh, two guests. Uh, uh, one will be via a live pre-recorded uh, video. Uh, Dirk, uh, Dirk, and uh, Mitchell from Perceiving Worlds, who explores. Uh, uh, semi-forgotten uh, 3D worlds online, and I and Bill, who does research into alternative archiving for uh, like topics like geocities. <laughs> um, something to stress, I think, about Dead Web Club is that it's an evolving thing. Like this is our first uh, event, let's say. So it's also we are not important <laughs> in any way so it's always like we want to be shaped by what people want to do what to look into so this is also something that we always want to keep open this communication line like it's not what me and Thomas want to show you it's what you guys want to kind of explore yourselves so that is something to be put forward very heavily I think uh, so if you have uh, if you have questions about Dead Web Club, you can just save them to the end of the of the event and the stream. We have a stream going on from people at home uh, watching. Uh, so also put them in the chat. We're monitoring the chat. So if you've got questions, put them there. We will answer them later tonight. Uh, we will start after this with the presentation by Dirk Mitchell from Perceiving Worlds. It's a pre-recorded video. It is uh, 57 minutes long. 
uh, if you want a drink, you can move around. For people in the audience here, just move around, get a drink at the bar. You don't need to necessarily sit down. Uh, and after that, we will have a five-minute break uh, for all the practical necessities. <laughs> uh, and then we have uh, Marion Bill's presentations with Q&A uh, and the end of the event. So thank everyone for coming. I really, we both really appreciate that there's interest in this. And thanks everyone for watching the stream. Uh, we, we appreciate you also. So let's uh, kick off the, the stream and presentation by Dirk and Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, my name is Derek Murphy. I am the director and uh, writer and narrator of the documentary series Preserving Worlds. And uh, I'm also a librarian in Boston, Massachusetts, who uh, does this filmmaking stuff on the side. I like to make documentary films. And my name is Mitchell Zemmel. Hi, I'm Derek's co-creator on Preserving Worlds. I'm a filmmaker, animator, and professor of animation living in Brooklyn, New York. For Preserving Worlds, I was responsible for the cinematography, editing, and some of the production logistics. So, um, first off, I'd like to say, you know, I really wish I could have been at this meeting live. Um, sadly, I uh, was not able to due to some complex and uh, unanticipated travel issues. I'm actually, as you hear my voice, I'm currently stuck on an airplane, uh, but I hope to make it to future Dead Web Club events. I think this is a really cool project. And uh, I, I really would like to thank V2 and Kendall and Thomas for having us on. Um, it's pretty exciting, and I'm very honored to be one of the first speakers at this club. So, yeah, I thought I'd get started and uh, introduce the series for those who may not have seen it before. So, uh, Preserving Worlds, we started out with it in. Uh, 2020. Uh, it was really a pandemic era project. It's a web series. It's uh, streaming on a streaming service called Means TV, which is a worker owned co op streaming service with a uh, far left bent to it. So, uh, you know, very excited to be working with them. It's an original series for them and they provided the funding. So, um, Preserving Worlds is a series about the preservation of uh, online virtual worlds and also um, offline games where player contributions are a major uh, component. So, for example, things like uh, Doom or ZZT, where there is a very robust uh, player-created like map-making community where uh, over time you have sort of like a art historical canon almost of works created just by non-developers, you know, just players of the games. So we're very interested in that kind of bottom-up player culture that develops both with online and offline games. And so the series is uh, very focused on that subject. Every episode takes a different game or virtual world and looks at it in depth by interviewing a prominent community member. So we're almost never actually interviewing the developer or creator of a game, but really more talking with people who have a, a really high stake in the community of the game who are generally just players, you know, regular people not directly involved in the creation or governance of the virtual world, but rather coming to it um, as a community member. So um, I wanted to start really by showing you this clip. This is an introduction to the series. This is sort of like uh, we created this as uh, almost like the little uh, one minute long track one of an album that just brings you into it, right? So I think this will sort of uh, explain the concept of the series better than even I could right now. So let's watch that and I'll be back in two minutes. <laughs> If you log on to a long-dead online game, what will you see? Who will you meet? When the profits have long dried up and the novelty has left, 
what keeps a virtual world going? What sorts of people are still hanging around? What kind of culture have they created? What traditions? What relationships? In 100 years, will anyone remember any of it? Virtual worlds are delicate things, and they can vanish with hardly a trace. You can archive the offline software, but a dead world can only tell you so much. It's just as important to document how people spent their time within it. Welcome to Preserving Worlds, a travelogue that takes us through some of the most interesting and impactful online games and communities of the past 40 years. Along the way, we'll meet people who are working against obsolescence to keep the communities they care about alive and accessible. Right, so you see, we're very interested in the um, historical legacy of virtual worlds, and we often cover, we tend to cover virtual worlds that have been around for quite a long time. Uh, we're interested in sort of how an online community, which, you know, online communities are a fairly new thing in terms of <laughs> human history, we're interested in um, what it looks like for an online community to age into the decades. So, when a community has been around for that long, I mean, we're starting to see basically the first old online communities, the first ones that are over 20 or 30 years old. And uh, we're interested in the dynamics that arise after that amount of time uh, where, you know, a solid player base has been interacting in one virtual world or around one game for long enough that maybe they've developed their own culture, terminology, relationships that are highly uh, complex and developed. So, um, how did we come to it? Well, um, myself as a librarian, and I've also worked as an archivist, I'm very interested in digital preservation, especially of born digital works, and uh, that does include um, web-enabled works or works that rely on an internet connection to uh, really work. So, when we're looking at virtual worlds, there's sort of a um, real preservation challenge you see there because, well, if you think about, you know, preserving, let's say, like a film reel, that's hard enough. You have to take care of it chemically, make sure it's going to last, make sure it's not getting moldy or, uh, the, you know, de decomposing in any way. But when you look at a born digital work, it can be even more challenging because you can't just put it in a room and let it sit for 50 years. You know, climate controlled room, just check on it now and then. No, you have to take active maintenance of it in order to make sure that the uh, given files can be read by future devices without being accidentally modified in some way or, you know, it's tricky. You got to keep the storage medium working and sometimes with digital uh, files that can be tricky. You know, you can't just have it on a hard drive and hope that one hard drive is going to keep working. Uh, you need to take more care than that. Um, and, you know, when we talk about an online game, that's an even bigger challenge. That's another layer of difficulty in preservation because let's say you have something like, you know, World of Warcraft or some other MMORPG. Now, maybe you save the software and you keep it running, run a bowl. You can emulate it or maybe migrate the files, get it working in 50 years. Then uh, if you boot it up and you actually can launch World of Warcraft, it's not going to be online. You're not going to be able to see anybody in the world. And isn't that the core of the meaning of these things is the player interaction? So the question is how are historians in the future going to be able to really get a sense of um what these virtual worlds meant to people what it was like to log into them and uh what it what it means historically so i think uh the answer to that 
Well, there are many answers, but one that we're focused on is documentation. We're interested in capturing now what it's like in those worlds and what people are doing in them, how they're using them, and keeping that documentation for posterity. So, you know, maybe you can't run, say, Mist Online Uru Live in uh, 2073, but maybe you can watch our episode on it and see someone who is uh, deep in that community talking about his experiences with it, describing the game, describing what it was like to play it telling interesting stories that illustrate um, interactions and culture and player-based governance. So that's kind of our thinking. It's sort of like we're making a series that is um, sort of educational about these dated virtual worlds that you know not everybody might know about, uh, sort of taking that anthropological or ethnographic lens where we're learning about the culture of the players. And also um, sort of making a record, a historical record of how those games exist and how they're played at the time that we're creating this series. So uh, we came out with um, season one in 2021, and we recently finished season two uh, earlier this year. So that came out around June, July of this year. Um yeah, and I should say that uh, a big inspiration for this series came out of a lot of research I was doing when I was in graduate school for library and information science. I uh, studied at one point um, the work of Henry Lowood and uh, the How They Got Game project, as well as the Preserving Virtual Worlds project. These are two academic projects that are being run by a number of different uh, institutions in collaboration. Henry Lowood is... Um, sort of, uh, I think, uh, at a high level of uh, running both of those. And he is a uh, curator of the history of science and technology at Stanford. So uh, his thinking on this subject was a big inspiration. Now, um, I think to sort of illustrate the emotional core of what I'm talking about, I'd like to show this clip of, um, it's from our RPG Maker episode where we talked with um, Stephen Gil Murphy, who is a sort of uh, creator of a cult classic RPG Maker game called Space Funeral. We talked with him about the RPG Maker uh, English speaking community. And um, in this clip, he's going to talk about sort of uh, a way that players have been preserving these very ephemeral, ephemeral excuse me, <laughs> these very ephemeral RPG Maker games just created by fans that um, even some of them that maybe just nobody knows about, people are still trying to keep them around. So uh, this is Stephen talking about that. A lot of the games I was just showing off come from the rare RPG request thread on RPGMaker.net. People make an effort to go to all the abandoned media fire links and so forth, try and find walking copies of what's still out there, so games, assets, patches, whatever else. I think there's a single user called Segnan. It started off as a request topic where you'd ask something of this one particular member and they would try and just dig through their hard drive and see if they had it. And then it became this elaborate resource and documentation project where you'd have a full list of how to contribute and notes on hosting. There's little tech demos for if you wanted to get a particular feature in your own project, you could download this and then it's kind of steal the way they did something. There's full projects. There's old games from people who kind of became better known in the games editors. There's collaborative games like the Alex projects. And all of these are uploaded one by one individually after all the previous hosting services. So Rapid Share, Mega Uploads, those are all kind of shut down one by one. So every time there's kind of this continuous push to put everything up in a new place in a way that it can kind of be kept active. So it is kind of perversely inspiring to see, especially considering that if you played some of these games with titles like Donald Fuck or RPG, produces a joke by someone called Daffy F in 2003 slowly being moved from hosting server to hosting server until it's like readily accessible on the most easily used file sharing program in 2022 like 19 years later that these could still survive is an inspiring and encouraging act now um i'd like to talk a bit about a little more about the goals of the series, about uh, what we were interested in and um, what we were trying to investigate as we were interviewing people. So um, we're, as I said, we're documenting ephemeral digital culture while it's still around. 
because as I'm sure everybody here knows, uh, things on the web do not last forever, right? This stuff is, uh, we're not talking about a diary someone wrote in the 1800s that got passed down through the family and you can just open it up and read someone's thoughts. You know, we're talking about stuff that is a lot harder to keep around than that. Uh, we're looking at hopefully uh, thinking about both the history of the internet and how it led up to today to maybe inform the future of the internet. So uh, the internet has changed quite a lot over the years, and um, we're trying not to just be a exercise in, in pure, simple nostalgia, sort of saying we just need to go back to those days. But there was a lot to treasure in the days of the old internet um, before certain uh, areas of commodification uh, really took hold. Although, of course, as we know, there always was commodification in the internet. Um, but yeah, sort of those old Wild West days, we're looking at uh, the legacy of those and thinking like, is there anything that can be taken from uh, the good of that time and uh, brought into the present and the future? We're interested in what it's like to spend time in these virtual worlds. Now, we know that um, all of these virtual worlds we've covered, they're all very different. They afford you uh, different, well, <laughs> affordances of control. Uh, maybe you have an avatar in a 2D space or in a 3D space, and your avatar can do different things. Maybe you can fly, maybe you can walk, maybe you can swim. Maybe it's text-based chat only. Maybe you have voice chat. And, um, you know, how do those different affordances construct a social experience that leads to higher level community um, over time? So, uh, yeah, how does the medium influence the message? And, uh, you know, what can we uh, learn from that? So trying to get that broad picture of different ways of interacting online over the years particularly uh, in virtual space, cyberspace, rather than just on the web, right? Um, for one thing, uh, it's a lot easier to film and uh, make legible and uh, in interesting uh, a 3D space in the medium of, of documentary, right, than, rather than just showing websites. Um, let's see. We're interested in uh, what sorts of people are inhabiting these worlds these days, you know? Um, what does it take to be a long, long, long-term community member? Um, you know, who's around a game that uh, launched in 1995, say, and uh, is hardly populated now? Like, who are the hangers-on, or who are the people that are still invested and interested? What are they like, and, you know, what what is their community like, right? Um, and we're very interested in... Um, sort of providing a balance like we we one challenge that we um were facing here was trying to balance the educational aspect and the entertainment aspect so how do you uh educate about the history of the internet how do you balance the historical side of things uh, trying to make a historical record that can help researchers today and in the future but also provide an entertaining TV show that can be entertaining to the general public. So we didn't want this to be inaccessible to anybody who's not already super familiar with the games in question or with internet culture in general. We wanted something that was um, accessible to really anybody with any background, with any level of knowledge of this subject matter. So um trying to really like onboard people into each game uh you know we provided some uh, narration at the beginning of every episode before our interview and uh tour and uh yeah just really give people a little bit of an onboarding into the um vocabulary like what the game is how it plays uh its historical significance and um just really bring people into it so um, uh, next, I think we'd like to talk about how we made this thing and uh, the considerations and challenges involved. So I think I'm going to really hand it off to Mitchell for most of this, uh, as he did a lot of the logistic work. But first off, I will talk a bit about our pre-interview preparation, our research. So um, 
Every episode is really a long form interview at its core, and we like to pair those interviews with a tour. So we have our guest uh, tour us around the virtual world or for an offline game, sort of give us a tour through uh, their favorite player contributions. So for example, with Doom, we had um, Liz Ryerson, a really excellent um, games writer and game developer herself and musician, uh, give us a sort of uh, a tour through her favorite Doom maps and build up sort of like a art history of Doom maps. Like here are trends, common trends, here are important works that led to, you know, that were inspirational in other works, etc. So but that did take the form of Liz sort of walking us through uh, different Doom maps in the game while talking with us. So for all of these, we we connected on a call with someone and uh, looked at the game with them and kind of traveled through the game with them. So first off, selecting the game, um, what makes a good game? Well, we wanted a game that we could uh, get together inside of with someone, uh, if possible. We wanted a visually interesting and charismatic game that would work on film. In season one, we uh, wanted to include a text-based game. For example, we wanted to talk about Gemstone, but we had a hard time figuring out how do we show a text-based game on film and make that interesting. Now, we did end up finding a way to do that in season two through um, the use of judicious uh, animation and other sort of visual assets that we created and added on to sort of keep people's visual interest. But so that was a a consideration as we were selecting games. We wanted to select games that had been around for a long time, for decades, that really show off um, sort of the history of the internet. We wanted to cover things not just from one era, but sort of have like a like a longitudinal look at, um, you know, here's an important online game from the 80s, here's one from the mid-90s, here's one from the 2000s, etc. And in our latest season, we even covered Final Fantasy XIV, which is a still, still one of the most popular massively multiplayer online RPGs going right now. So we really kind of went from uh, the early 80s all the way to now over the course of the series. And um, we wanted games where uh, there was always a level of player creativity and player contribution. So we wanted virtual worlds where players could create their own spaces or significantly contribute to the um, the look and feel and sense of place uh, and sense of culture of the game. And uh, we also, in terms of selecting people, we wanted people that were deeply of the community but we like i said we didn't necessarily want developers most of the time we wanted a bottom-up approach sort of in keeping with means tv's leftist approach as a streaming service we wanted to really take that bottom up like you know rather than talk with the creators like how how do the actual just the people approaching the users of these virtual worlds and games how do they influence these so sort of um, separate from any consideration of capital, you know, these people aren't here to make money. These people are contributing to these games out of sort of like a both a community orientation and an artistic orientation in the case of Doom or ZZT, you know, or RPG Maker. Um, these are, they can be sort of platforms for a sort of like folk art almost, right? These are regular people, not necessarily programmers, using easily approachable and often free or extremely cheap tools in order to express themselves in a way that in many cases ends up becoming pretty popular and can often be quite influential on more mainstream game development. So um, yeah, a lot of talking with people maybe that um, reaching out to people that maybe I was already familiar with from their work. For example, as I mentioned, Liz Ryerson, I was familiar with her writing. Reaching out to people that Mitchell or I knew personally that we knew were deeply invested in a particular community. It helps uh, having already been uh, embedded in certain like uh, <laughs> quasi-academic or um, particularly uh, like weirdo or like high level of discourse game communities uh, certainly helped to uh, make connections and meet people that we felt were 
going to be great subjects for episodes. And uh, really sometimes just reaching out to people out of the blue with no prior connection. Um, for example, in our Active Worlds episode in season two, um, I was familiar with the work of Bruce Damer, a early uh, sort of like tech evangelist for um, early virtual worlds um, back in the 90s. He formed a group called the Contact Consortium that was dedicated to um, basically shepherding virtual world technology into the mainstream. I was familiar with him from a book he wrote about virtual worlds from the 90s and uh, found that he was still active on social media and uh, had a website with a contact form. And I just sort of reached out to him out of the blue and said, you know, I'm very interested in your historical perspective on this subject. And um, he was willing to speak with us. Similarly, I reached out to an archivist at the uh, Danish Royal Library, who is sort of the video game preservation guy there to talk about Hundeparken, a Danish uh, browser-based social game um, that he was familiar with the history of. And he, as an archivist, he actually was able to uh, do some archival work on the game and collect a lot of assets and such that, um, you know, your average person would have a much harder time getting a hold of. So that was really cool. Um, so yeah, we talked with all kinds of people. I think they provided amazing insights and um, ideas and thoughts about the history of these games. So uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Mitchell to talk some more about the logistics of, of uh, actually putting these episodes together and uh, talk further about some of the insights we've learned from doing this work. Uh, thanks again for having me. Hello again. <laughs> All right. Um, as Derek uh, suggested, I'm back to uh, first talk to you about the logistics of putting together a project along these lines. Um, we believe that there's a chance that some of you are either in the midst of uh, or might be interested in doing something similar, archiving um, some sort of web or virtual content. And so hopefully some of our lessons and, you know, things that we picked up along the way, um, you can fold into your own work. So I would say when it comes to making a virtual world documentary or archival project, uh, one of the first things that's really important to do is seriously consider what your project's specific goals are um, beyond, you know, the actual archival <laughs> or documentary process. Um, I guess I'll give an example. So for us, specifically, um, with Preserving Worlds, we knew that uh, we were providing a sort of edutainment uh, sort of pr um, product. Uh, Means TV is first and foremost a streaming service for, you know, entertainment um, and for, you know, just a uh, consumer user base to uh, enjoy and consume. Uh, and so this was not an exclusively academic project. Um, the way that it was described to us uh, was um, sort of a 50-50 split uh, between entertainment and education um, or, you know, historical record. So, you know, having to keep that in mind. Um, we also, uh, being informed by that sort of edutainment uh, balance, um, one of the things that uh, I knew I was setting out to do specifically with the footage that we were gathering inside of these games was I knew that I wanted to capture the spatial and emotional qualities of each of these environments, um, both for, you know, the purpose of, you know, documenting that information visually, uh, but also considering that um, the spatial and emotional qualities of these games, uh, the architecture, the geometry of these different games uh, is going to be... Uh, one of the more visually distinctive qualities from one episode to the next. And beyond the games themselves, our episodes are also subject-driven, as Derek, you know, talked about. We're finding um, important or at least involved members of 
the user communities in these games. So again, these are project goals that were specific to us. They are by no means, you know, the standard for what you need to do. But again, um, that's why it's important uh, if you were to make a project like this to consider what your goals are, because they're going to inform um, the entire production process and how exactly that works for you. Um, and it took us a, a few times, a few episodes, <laughs> um, as we're working on this to settle in on our sweet spot of what works best. And for us, we settled on essentially um, a minimum of two different shooting sessions per episode, per video game or virtual environment. Um, so we would first have an in-world interview, and then later on we would uh, go back into uh, the world to gather B-roll. And um, I'll try and walk through the process for us as it is generically laid out. You know, episodes may vary, um, you know, from time to time. We didn't follow this religiously, but this is what seemed to work best for us. Our first uh, shooting session um, would typically be the in-world interview, as I would call it. Uh, all of our interviews were done with our subjects, our interviewees, in world, which is to say, while playing the game, uh, while on an audio call, um, as using Zoom usually or Google Hangouts, uh, whatever works. We wanted things to feel candid. We wanted things to feel like you know they were actually happening in this space rather than sitting down with somebody um, you know in a parlor or an office space or something and just talking abstractly about the game. We wanted to feel like we were in there, in the moment, as we're talking to folks, and we found that, um, you know, what better way um, to get that effect than to literally be in there with them as they're showing us around, um, sort of like a digital uh, uh, tour, if you think of um, MTV's Cribs, if that's not <laughs> too dated of a reference. Um, but they're showing us our crib, they're showing us um, their neighborhood, their community, um, the world in which, you know, they have the familiarity uh, and level of comfort. Um, so we start with the in-world interview, and uh, while we're filming uh, for this interview, not only are we recording audio and capturing um, our interviewee's words in order to, you know, uh, build the episode later, um, but in this uh, particular shoot, I guess you, you might call it a virtual film shoot, uh, one of the most important things that we need to do is capture the subject's avatar. Um, because naturally, this is sort of our one chance to uh, physically see um, whoever it is we're interviewing. We don't really cut to anybody's real life um, you know, persona or, or image. And that is, again, intentional to get you feeling like you're not just talking about a virtual space, but you are inhabiting one um, within the episode. And so this is our really our main chance um, to get good coverage of the subject's avatar. So um, oftentimes, while Derek's leading and conducting the interview mostly, um, I'm doing what I can to film uh, the avatar of whoever we're speaking with, um, you know, get different shots, get different kinds of coverage, close-ups, long shots, medium shots, um, you know, trying to use what I've learned in film school and apply it as best as possible to these game environments, uh, while of course keeping up with these avatars because they're often running around showing us places, you know, we want them to feel uninhibited and so they're free to roam around the game, fly around, uh, teleport here, teleport there, and just act completely organically and naturally um, while I and Derek act as sort of the invisible crew um, in most cases as much as possible, um, trying to fly around behind them and uh, collect a bit of uh, good footage, hopefully. <laughs> um, beyond that... Um, being in world uh, with our subjects, with our interviewees, our guests, um, there's often spontaneous moments that will happen. Um, 
unplanned things where somebody will see something crazy happen or, you know, some crazy in-world event or, you know, just some sort of unexpected encounter. And in some cases, uh, that will get discarded in the edit, but a lot of times, especially if it's a particularly charismatic moment uh, and particularly entertaining, um, that's something that we definitely want to be able to capture. And so uh, we have to be vigilant in the event that something like that's going to happen. Uh, for example, in our missed episode, uh, there's a moment where our interviewee uh, humorously falls into a hole and is unable to escape without, you know, exiting to uh, sort of the main world. Um, there's another moment where a cone, um, a traffic cone in the game just kind of glitches out and the physics is kind of broken and it falls through the ground. Um, and those are both um, just humorous, humanizing events that, um, you know, remind you that the interviewee is not some, you know, uh, incredible authoritative figure, um, but is just a, often cases a regular user, um, you know, maybe with, you know, outsized standing in the community, but um, nonetheless, you know, all too human and, um, you know, keeps in line with sort of the fun, lighthearted tone um, that we are um, a lot of times um, trying to engage with. So having fun random moments like that, we want to be vigilant while we are interviewing. Um, I will say that in these in-world interviews, um, balancing all of these different things obviously isn't always perfectly successful. So in a lot of cases, our footage might look something like this example from when we were uh, recording an episode on Second Life. And um, you can see that in a lot of cases, as much as we're trying to avoid it, um, we might, um, you know, be playing the game um, as it's meant to be played, um, which is to say you're adjusting your camera constantly, you're kind of moving around a lot, um, you know, we're keeping up with our subjects who are, you know, moving around and exploring things. Um, we're zooming in, zooming out, trying to figure out, you know, where we're going uh, in some cases. Um, and all of that shaky footage, um, for some folks, it might be important to keep footage like that um, because it shows, you know, maybe a more natural or um, intended or expected way of playing the game. Um, that might just be a normal part of gameplay, um, especially for something that's tactical, um, some sort of MMORPG environment uh, where combat is focused on more heavily. Um, you might be adjusting the camera and moving around like crazy and maneuvering uh, around enemies and the like. But, um, once again, you know, going back to our goals, um, and knowing that we wanted to have, um, a sort of more polished look of, you know, a piece of, um, both education as well as, um, entertainment that is maybe a little more easily consumed, um, shaky footage like that, um, can, well, to put it, you know, simply, uh, it can make people motion sick. <laughs> and that's something that you don't realize when you're playing the game. Um, but then you look at the footage detached from that context. Um, if you're looking at somebody else, um, you know, playing through a game and moving their camera around, um, there's a lot of camera shake and it can um, be a little discomforting, uh, at least for some folks. So, you know, that footage isn't always um, what we're trying to use in the end. Once we have our in-world interview, we thank our guest, you know, we try to um, <laughs> let them know that we'll be in touch as the progress happens, but also knowing that that is just the beginning of what is generally a nine to 10 month process uh, from the point of finishing the interview to finishing a particular episode. There's, in fact, uh, quite a few more steps we got to get through. Uh, the main one, um, or sort of overarching process, being the actual editing of the episode. In the episode, you could say, um, 
the the edit of the episode, sorry, was um, generally broken into um, a few discrete processes. Um, first of which is the assembly cut. Um, this is the most bare bones edit that you're going to see. Um, essentially, the purpose of the assembly is to simply compile the recordings from interviewees and uh, the interviewers. So, um, record, you know, my video recording, Derek's video recording, our audio recordings, as well as the audio recordings of any folks that we are interviewing. And so getting all of these audio and video files together and syncing them up, um, that is our assembly cut. Um, that synchronization process is a little bit muddier for a virtual project. Um, any sort of communication over the internet, over Wi-Fi, is going to have tiny little bits of lag or delay. And so uh, a lot of times you might sync up the claps uh, on three different audio files, but you'll find that one person is always talking 10 seconds before um, Derek is. And so um, there's a little bit of fidgeting and fussing in order to make it actually sound like a logical normal conversation. Um, but that said, it's, it's still a relatively bare bones, straightforward process. And the result is basically our raw footage all put together on a timeline. At that point, once I finished the assembly, I would send the edit to Derek, who would then complete the next step, which is the selects. Um, for the selects, um, Derek is simply going through the entire interview um, for a 30-minute, 40-minute episode. We would typically interview somebody for about two hours, uh, sometimes closer to an hour and a half. Um, but Derek will go through that entire clip and um, pick out moments, uh, select parts, as it were, um, that to him feel like they are particularly important and things that, you know, we need to keep in the episode. From the selects, um, Derek will send the project back to me and uh, I will begin creating the rough cut of the episode. Essentially trying to, um, you know, condense everything into a more watchable length. We eventually arrive at a point where, start to finish, the interviewee's words are pretty much in line with what we believe the episode will be, uh, start to finish. And so we can begin going from, um, we can transition from the radio cut, the rough stage, into a process of further polish and refinement, uh, what we might call a clean cut. Um, at this point... The, our, our changes are getting more nitty-gritty. Um, you know, I'm doing what I can to cut out uh, any parts uh, where the interviewee is awkwardly pausing, trying to find their words, trying to make folks sound as good as possible if somebody's uh, stammering over their words or what they're trying to say. That's an opportunity to come in and cut out some of the ums and hums. This is also the stage at which it becomes uh, abundantly clear to Derek and I um, where we are missing sort of footage. That brings us to our second shoot that we'll do, um, which is the B-roll shoot. Um, occasionally, we'll do multiple B-roll shoots, but at a minimum, we generally have at least one. Um, the B-roll is an opportunity to get more polished footage of our environment, to capture new spaces and offer more visual variety to our uh, collection of footage, and try to showcase any other content, any other community uh, or users or, or what have you, um, any elements of the space that uh, we hear about in the interview but maybe don't get a chance to properly see. So we're really expanding our coverage. A lot of times we're also revisiting any of the spaces that we go to with our subject um, to get more detail shots and, again, to get more um, carefully constructed shots. Um, and 
this is also an opportunity. We are not bound by the timing of an hour and a half to two hour interview. We can film freely for as long as we want. And so this is an opportunity for us to try a lot of different things and see what visually lands the best, see what has uh, for us the best value. This is a quick example um, that I'm showing here from uh, Mist Online Uru. Um, when we went back in for B-roll, um, a lot of times this was a chance for me to get um, specific camera shots um, that, again, are a great uh, way of showing off the geometry of these spaces and show off, um, you know, what's, what's nice architecturally, graphically, um, sort of the design of these spaces. Um, and one of the ways that we try to do that in filmmaking is with uh, camera motion, um, adding the dimension of a camera panning or pulling out, pulling back, um, can really showcase dimensional qualities in an environment. And uh, for us, um, you know, we're often not trying to be like an action film. We're trying to get, you know, shots that are a little more, uh, if not grandiose, that might be too big of a word, but um, we're trying to, um, you know, showcase these spaces in a way that's not so flashy, um, but in a way that is visually appealing. Um, and so having a particularly slow camera motion is really nice. Um, so when we're not, you know, trying to follow our interviewees from place to place really quickly, um, as much as possible, as much as the game's settings will allow, um, I'm trying to turn down my walk speed or my movement speed as slow as it can get. And I'm also... Um, oftentimes moving in really weird uh, ways that you wouldn't naturally if you're playing the game. Um, in a lot of 3D games, for example, if you walk backwards but at a slight angle to a wall, um, if you're walking into a wall but not you know, perfectly perpendicular, uh, if that makes sense, um, you'll be able to very slowly slide across that wall and the result on, you know, the end of your camera is a really beautiful, majestic, uh, slow-moving camera shot. Um, and so that uh, became a, a, a commonality for me in all of these spaces. I'm, I'm trying as much as possible to do, um, to just back into walls and <laughs> move really slowly that way. Um, and sometimes it takes a couple of trial and errors. Um, the actual footage itself, the gameplay, looks very weird, um, but the end result is often um, very usable footage that um, you know suggests a higher production value, and so uh, it becomes worth it. <laughs> um, once we've finished up with our B-roll, um, we implement it into our clean cut. We just add that visual on top of the audio that we're um, putting together. And at this stage, we're also beginning to add our background music, um, any additional graphics that we might need. Um, as far as the music goes, um, we're mostly trying to use stuff that's from these actual games. Uh, some of the games don't have... Uh, background music of any kind, or if they do, it might be like a 60-second musical piece that loops indefinitely, and that might be okay for like a little online social space, but it doesn't really work as well for a 30-minute episode of hearing the same song 30 times over and over and over again. Um, so we will try and scout uh, the internet for uh, I guess other internet music, uh, oftentimes sort of more ambient vaporwave uh, that we feel fits the tone of the episode and, you know, we'll license with the artists to get their permission, yada yada, um, and that can be a whole thing, <laughs> um, but we'll do that, we'll, um, you know, 
put together the graphics uh, presentation. Um, at this point, uh, we might have uh, additional animations that are overlaid on top of the uh, footage um, to add just a little bit of character. Um, a lot of times we have this motif of a window being dragged in um, by a computer cursor and it opens it up and it's kind of like a little pop-up window that shows some additional information um, that's, you know, being talked about by our interviewee at that moment. Um, we also have these wonderful animated avatars. I mean, you've seen Derek's and mine, um, as well as, you know, from other clips. And these avatars are designed um, as still image portraits um, by a friend of ours, Bachelor Soft. Um, I'll then take those and I'll animate the mouth smacking, mouth jaw moving animation. Um, just to add uh, a little more immersion, a little more character and uh, production value. And ultimately, all of these little different graphics that we have. Um, you know, don't do much to change the character and content of our episodes, um, but in our minds, hopefully, um, help tie everything together. If anything, having that same layout uh, from one episode to the next uh, helps our series specifically feel like a continuous project, um, especially because the games that we are exploring are all so visually distinct um, to use sort of their different uh, displays and layouts um, would be a disservice to um, specifically the point of trying to make our episodes feel like a contiguous project. Um, that is, again, tying into uh, our specific goals and, um, you know, what we are specifically doing with this project as a piece of entertainment uh, commodity. Uh, <laughs> so, um, for academic purposes, obviously you don't need to go about animating your own specific layouts and having all these extra, um, you know, dazzly, uh, things. But if you are making, say, a web series show, um, that is meant to be both informative and entertaining, um, it doesn't hurt to have this sort of visual continuity from one episode to the next um, that ties everything together. Um, at that point, you know, our episodes are basically done. And then we can notify our guests. We can let them know, hey, uh, you know, we finished up. Uh, why don't you take a look? And uh, for us specifically, it's important that our guests are able to see at least a working cut of the episode, if not the final version, um, just in order to confirm with them that we are not... Um, mincing their words in any way or uh, twisting what they say in the edit. Um, you know, a lot of times we're cutting things together and you don't always know if you're unintentionally um, suggesting uh, the facts uh, differently than how they are. So we don't want to misrepresent our guests. We don't want to misrepresent what they are saying in their own words. And so we make sure that they sign off on um, how we've put their two-hour interview into, you know, a more self-contained 30-minute, 40-minute um, product. So a few takeaways in summary. Um, if you're making your own uh, virtual world documentary or archival project, um, it's important to prepare and to be practiced um, I would say don't be afraid to go in to the world as many times as you need to get what you're looking for. If you are trying to showcase um, a specific phenomenon or a specific quality inside the virtual world, um, you know, make sure you're doing that. Make sure you're representing it um, as close to uh, a faithful reproduction in your footage as possible. Um, and, you know, more broadly, just knowing your angle, knowing what's important for you to showcase um, is, you know, a important and mandatory decision, in my opinion. Um, I would say if you are trying to do everything, if you are trying to show the objective 
um, you know, 100% inclusive, holistic idea of what these games are like, what these spaces are like, um, you will most likely fail. And that is not to be pessimistic, but just pragmatic to the point that um, if you have an angle, you're able to focus on that and show very strongly um, what that angle might be. Um, that's not necessarily, um, you know, coming out of particular subjectivity or bias. Um, it is merely, um, you know, just a recognition of you only have so much time uh, with people's attention. And it's important to be able to make a decision, to have the authority to say, this is what's important. This is what's important for you to know about these spaces. This is important for what's important for me to show about them and uh, to go from there. Uh, it's going to ultimately strengthen the results of your project. Um, at the end, um, you might also want to be considering your attribution, how you want to handle the attribution process. Um, for us, in our credits, uh, we did as much as we could to try and highlight authors of any user-created worlds that we visit, uh, and especially anything that's not coming from the original base game produced by the developers. Um, that is more or less assumed, you know, to be what it is. <laughs> um, but when it comes to um, games like ZZT, when it comes to um, custom Doom wads, Doom maps... Um, and, you know, any spaces of that sort, whenever possible, um, it was really valuable for us to try and record um, the different places we went to and the different authors of them, if only because um, we wanted people to, who are watching this show to be able to visit some of these spaces themselves, um, to be able to look at um, oh, this was an interesting, um, you know, this is an interesting looking space. Um, I wonder who did it. I wonder if I can check it out myself. And so being able to attribute um, the names of these different um, user creations as well as their authors makes them much easier to be looked up in a simple Google search. And so, um, you know, that becomes sort of a part of our mission statement um, with our episodes. With that, I just want to say uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, once again, our apologies for not making it in person, but hopefully we will have a chance to convene with the Dead Web Club at another time in the future. Um, if you do have questions, um, I would say uh, feel free to find us online. Um, Derek is at Derek L. Murphy on the website formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> uh, I am Mitchell Zemmel on the same uh, website. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm sorry that we couldn't make it for a Q&A, but if you do have questions, don't hesitate to find us on the Internet. And, um, yeah, thanks again. I uh, hope you all have a wonderful time uh, on the Internet. And... Uh, in real life and all that good stuff. Okay, bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe on the stream. Well, uh, thank you for everyone for for sitting on for the for 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 the for the for the, for the video stream and the presentations. I also want to say thanks to Derek and Mitchell if they happen to watch a, the recording of this because they very graciously uh, filmed this last night going into this morning because they really thought that they could be here live. But uh, as you heard from Derek, he's on a plane, so not so not so easy. So thank you to you both. You are wonderful. <laughs> and, and thanks everyone that uh, are watching it on the stream. We appreciate it. Uh, we're going to have a, a five-minute break now before the next uh, presentation. So everyone, I, I guess, at home, you can relax and take five minutes. Everyone in the audience here, you know, the bar's open, uh, the, the fresh air is outside. Uh, uh, stand up and, and move around a bit. So we'll see you in uh, five minutes.
Welcome everyone uh, back to Dead World Club. I hope you had a relaxing uh, break. Uh, we're gonna start like the like the, the final presentation tonight uh, by Marine. So if Marine could come to the stage, then we can start the presentation. Seems like it is, okay. Um, yeah, now this works as well. Thanks for having me. Um, I think it's really exciting to to, deep in, to dive into the, the dead web and the alive web and everything in the middle. Um, so I'll briefly introduce myself. Um, I'm Marijn Brill. I work as a freelance uh, media art curator um, and writer once in a while as well. Um, I look mostly at, uh, as I like to call it, the complexity and absurdity of the internet, which I think com will come back in this presentation as well, um, where I make exhibitions, I sometimes curate more discursive programs, um, and I write essays about things such as digital culture and internet culture, which I'll talk about today. Um, other geeky stuff like memes, um, and a whole bunch of other things that, that relate to that. Um, so yeah, I think it's really cool to have a dead web club, um, because it's so particularly nerdy that it's nice to start a club and make it even more nerdy. Um, and I think it's nice to consider how the dead internet, um, or to, it's nice to have different people together who are invested in the history of the internet. Um, because by doing so, we can also then think about the, the present and we can think about the possible futures of the internet differently. Um, so I think what's in that name of the dead web is this idea that when websites shut down, this online content disappears, um, unless someone actually dares to archive it, uh, which I guess is the premise of the idea of the dead web. Um, and today I'll talk specifically about GeoCities, which is one particular example of something that we may consider a formal, a formal version of social media, although slightly different. Um, it's a web hosting service where people could make their own websites and it's known actually for the way that it abruptly shut it down and the fact that a lot of people were very upset about that. Um, different organizations were involved in archiving what used to be 38 million web pages of user-generated contents. Um, I think that's still less than, for instance, Instagram today, but then again, back then a lot of, um, a lot of content. Um, and I will specifically focus on an artistic project. Uh, it's called One Terabyte of Kilobyte Age by Olia Lilina and Dragon Esponchit. Um, and they engage in this project with that data set in different ways. Um, so I wrote an article about this for View Journal. Uh, it's the Journal of European Television History and Culture uh, with the same title. Um, and that was based on literature that I found and a lot of different names will come back, such as uh, the, the curator and researcher Anna Decker, who I think is a very important one to mention here. Um, and I also then uh, interviewed the artist and actually asked about what this project means to them, how they went about it, and all the kind of nitty gritty details um, of the project and how they position and consider it. Um, so what I wanna ask, or what I ask in this article and what I'll talk about today, um, is this idea of how artists engage with a data set That's the dead web talking. Okay, no, I'm still going on. Um, let me see, because I think we lost here the connection. It's not it's the reason it's called Lab for the Unstable Media. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> sure, people have made that joke over and over. <laughs> let me see, I don't think it's my hardware over here, but maybe it is. So I'll just unplug and we plug it back in. Weird though. Hey Siri. <laughs> 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 Siri's certainly not that. <laughs> Let's try again. Ah, yeah. Okay, we're back up. This was a tiny technical error, uh, back to the alive slash dead internet. Um, okay, yes, yeah, so what I was saying, um, I'm interested in how these artists then engage with this data set of dead internet um, and now are so far working connection. 
um, and how their particular way of engaging with that data set then differs from quote unquote classical way of web archiving, although I think a lot of people will agree that web archiving already isn't necessarily classical compared to other forms of archiving. Um, so I'm asking what exactly is particular about their position and what does that open up in terms of the meaning making that's involved. Um, I'll give a very, very, very brief introduction to GeoCities and its fall. Uh, do consider they were around for around 15 years and I'll say something for a couple minutes, so very brief. So they started in 1994. Um, here we see a, a screenshot of, I think this is 1996. Um, and they started out by David, it was started out by David Bonnet and John Retzner. Um, when you signed up as a user, you would get 15 megabytes of free storage, which today is not that much. Um, you could publish your own website and use their GeoCities page builder and also you, uh, further customize it in HTML. Um, what's very important here to mention is how um, when you build such a web, or when you used to build such a website, you would actually choose a city where your um, web was then situated. So this was before we had Google, this was before you would index your websites and understand the internet in that particular way. And these cities then help to have this spatial metaphor where you could really consider how you live in a space, you live in a city, you live in a neighborhood, and your website did that too. So you actually had a quote unquote neighbor in a particular way. Um, so to give examples, um, they were organized by themes or by interests. So Athens and Acropolis were for education and philosophy, uh, Hollywood for entertainment, Vienna for classical music and ballet. Um, doesn't mean you actually have to live in Vienna yourself, you can live wherever, but you would then pick Vienna as a city to host or for your website to, to live and to, to stay. Um, in 1999, which was the end of the dot-com bubble, um, it was actually the third most visited website on the internet. So in that moment, very important, very big website on and very big part of internet culture. Um, and then Yahoo decided to buy it and they spent $3.6 billion on it. So that's in that moment again, quite a, a large sum. Um, and they changed it in different ways and made it actually kind of unpopular by doing so. So what they did is they ended this structure of actually having these cities. Um, then they tried the different ways of having paid, paid plans, so people had to actually sign up and pay a monthly um, sum, as you can also see here. And they added more advertising. Um, a lot of people were quite unhappy about this. Um, so they bought this in 1999, and then um, they actually decided to close it 10 years after, in 2009. Uh, this had to do with the fact that this aesthetic was considered, I would say, kind of lame, very bad taste, because professional web design became a whole different thing, so all these... You'll see it later on, uh, cat aesthetics, blinking GIFs, and a bunch of weird colors, things going on, um, weren't really considered proper web building, proper websites anymore. Um, and on top of that, people were moving to other social media platforms, and they simply really couldn't make money out of it, even actually trying it with these paid plans. Um, they announced to close it on April 23rd in 2009, and actually closed in October uh, later that year. Um, so there were different organizations involved in then trying to save GeoCities after it was announced it would shut down. Um, I'll talk briefly about Archive Team, uh, Internet Archive and Restorative Land, which is a mirror. There are also others, but these are some of the most important ones. So Archive Team um, started scraping content as soon as it was announced GeoCities would close. Um, they described themselves as a loose collective of work architects, programmers, writers, and loudmouths dedicated to saving our digital cultural heritage. Um, it was started by Jason Scott, the, the, the activist and archivist, and he initiated almost as, a, as an activist gesture, and he said, Yahoo succeeded in destroying the most amount of history in the shortest amount of time. Um, they then spent a lot of machines and a lot of computing and personal and human brain power um, on trying to save as much data as possible, and they did so between April and October 2009, um, collecting a data set of one terabyte. Uh, this data set was made public um, as a torrent and then technically improved over and over. You can still download this torrent online freely. Um, and they have this idea or they work on this basis of saying archive first, ask questions later, which is basically means scrape whatever you can get now and then don't really build in difficult protocols that actually makes that process very complicated. This is maybe the first glimpse of the beauty of this type of web design. Um, so another important agent to mention is the Internet Archive, a um, big organization that also is or hosts this idea of the Wayback Machine. 
So they were already capturing different snapshots before uh, the announcement that it would shut down, and then they intensified their crawl once it was announced that it would close. Um, people could also nominate websites they really liked, so you could say, hey, I think this website's really cool, or this is made by my actual neighbor, I made this myself, and then they would save it for you. Um, and they have a special collection, actually, within their archive, of only with particularly GeoCities, because Internet Archive, of course, is much bigger than that. They do a whole lot of other things, too. Um, their main mission is to preserve a record of the Internet for generations to come. Um, and interestingly, archive team was quite angry at how Yahoo treated this particular cultural heritage. Um, but the Internet Archive, thanked Yahoo multiple times, seemed much friendlier in their approach, collaborated to some degree, so they actually had a different relationship. Um, some snapshots of kind of stuff that is still out there on the Internet Archive. So what you can do is, and that's how Internet or how Wayback Machine works in general, is you have a URL that you can fill out and then you find snapshots in different moments in time. So sometimes you can see how things are changing throughout time um, because you actually have multiple snapshots. If you're lucky, it kind of depends. Um, this is another one, for instance. Um, but for all, in all these cases, so you can see in different moments in time, but in all cases, you need to know what the actual URL is. So if you don't have a URL in mind, you can't really find stuff. Um, which is where the next example comes in, um, which is a mirror that's called Restorative Land. Um, and there are a lot of different mirrors actually on the internet, and they kind of come and go. So if you find them and come to different pages, you'll see that sometimes they're offline again, and then sometimes people start a new one. Um, and the nice thing with these mirrors is that someone basically did part of the work for you in terms of if you don't have to download that entire terabyte, it probably won't fit on your computer. Um, and you don't have to actually find those nitty gritty URLs to know what kind of guinea pigs are on this website. Um, but you can do it differently by looking at that mirror. So that means in this particular case, you'll have an overview of cities and then within those cities you have suburbs. Um, they, so Restorative Lens is then one of those mirror sets up right now. They're not part of Archive Team nor of Internet Archive. They kind of exist independently. Um, and they say that they're hosting a restored visual gallery of the archive GeoCity site sorted by neighborhood. Uh, what they mentioned on their website is that somewhere between a library and a living museum, we're working on experimental new ways to close the gap between archival and visibility of the web that was lost. Um, so as you see here, you have then thumbnails within those particular suburbs, um, and then you can actually open those websites. And the nice thing is the pens per website, some of them are working quite well, and you see all this blinking and moving and stuff's going on. Um, sometimes not, and you have missing links and missing images, and it kind of depends on which one you're looking at. Um, and as I said, the nice thing is you can really explore, so you can actually click through and kind of get into these different rabbit holes instead of needing to gather your information before you can have a proper look. Um, so the interesting thing is that, and it, I think this argument can go two different ways, it kind of depends on from what perspective you approach it. Um, because these archive efforts were done by the archive team, by the Internet Archive, by all these mirrors, um, you can actually use that particular torrent of that one terabyte as a resource for research by different people in digital culture research. Um, you could also say the other way around, because it's available, people get excited to research simply because it's there. So it depends a little bit where do you see, uh, how do you look at it. Um, and there is a lot of research that has been done so far. This is a selection of some different academic journals, but there are, of course, more uh, since I started looking at this. Um, so some examples are community, uh, nostalgia, this idea of diaries. Different people had diaries on their website, so someone actually looked particularly at that function. Um, ethical considerations for access, um, and then platform policies and user protests, of course, in relationship to Yahoo. Um, then one terabyte of kilobyte H, quite long name, so I'll refer to it as one terabyte. Um, so that's a project that has started in 2010, um, and it's a body of work, so it really consists of multiple other projects that focuses on restoring, preserving, and circulating uh, this internet culture of GeoCities. Um, it's a project that's a collaboration between Olielia and Lina, um, who I'm sure many of you know. She's an esteemed internet artist, theorist, curator, and importantly, a GIF model. Um, and then she worked together with Dragon Espensheet, who is an 8-bit musician, uh, a media artist, and he has been since 2014 uh, the preservation director of Rhizome, which is an organization for digital-born um, art in New York City. Um, so before One Terabyte, they were working together already. Um, and they were looking at different projects that related to this idea of the early internet um, before um, 
as they said, this swallowed everything else and GeoCities became this mess of projects on its own um, and didn't really fit into this bigger collection of other explorations. Um, and what's important to mention here is that one terabyte as a project really considers this idea that users are important agents. Um, so we're not only talking about how the history of the internet is about software and hardware, and of course that is part of it, and it's an approach you see often in, in the history of technology. Um, but it's also very important to consider this aesthetic and these social practices that are part of that history of the internet. Um, in a way similar to the previous presentation that talked about community and people actually being in these virtual worlds rather than only the infrastructure. Um, one way how they talk about that is through this term of digital folklore. Um, and they made, they published a book that actually has that same title. Um, and they consider this idea of digital folklore as encompassing um, the customs, traditions, and elements of visual, textual, and audio culture that emerged from users' engagements with personal computer applications during the last decades of the 20th and the first decade of the 21st century. Rather long definition. Um, so what they did is that they manifested the engagement with the GeoCities data sets in interrelated projects, um, one being a Tumblr website, then they have a research blog and different gallery presentations. Um, so the Tumblr, um, it's quite nice. I mean, you can find it on your computer or on your phone. Um, it's a photo op system where what they do is that they're continuously sharing fragments of that very large data set um, by creating this photo op, which is an automatic virtualized system. So they have a total of 380,934 pages um, that they have been posting since 2014. And they publish a new image every 20 minutes, so that's 72 images a day. Um, that's the pace that's actually dictated by Tumblr itself, because you can really only post three images per hour on Tumblr to prevent people from spamming, etc. Um, the main strategy of the artist is to have this idea to actually give the, the culture of these former users and people that are, of course, still online, although in different spaces, um, to give them back to these users with this main narrative of time, um, to prevent them from really being overwhelmed by this terabyte that you can never really look properly look through. Um, and the funny thing is, if you look at it now, and I mean, this was a photo from this morning, I think, um, but it's, as again, updates constantly, um, that right now they're sharing posts from people that were last, or websites that were last edited in April 2007. Um, and the researcher got to the slice quite, oh no. Maybe it's coming back, or not? Maybe it was actually Siri that, Oh, that I was saying hi. No, right? Yep. Ah, okay, we are. Okay. I was about to talk about the temporal dissonance of Katrina's <laughs> slice that's now nicely introduced <laughs> with this little gap. Um, so this idea of temporal dissonance is that historical time unfolds in the present. So there is time that actually is continuing that's not static, but it's unfolding, and there is current time, and those start to overlap and create this very complex understanding of time itself, um, specifically being those websites unfolding and, of course, the world and time itself unfolding. Um, so the interesting thing here is that instead of reanimating those websites, I mean, they reanimate those websites and by doing that, oh no. Um, by doing that, they prevent it to become a static uh, data set and it actually becomes a more performative gesture. Not to touch my computer anymore. Um, so um, this idea of what they did is so they had this Tumblr website that shares this screenshot, but the screenshots themselves are quite particular as well. And this was actually discussed by um, Espen Sheet in an article for in Rise Home that he he, uh, he published a while ago, and he talks about it as this trade-off between authenticity on the one hand and then ease of access on the other. Um, so authenticity is how you look at content, and that is also then influenced by the hardware that you have, the software that you have. Um, when it comes to internet, it's also influenced by your, uh, your operating system and even by the type of browser you operate, um, because those browsers quite literally form your window into the internet. Um, and then ease of access, of course, refers to actually being able to access information. Um, the most authentic thing to do is to actually emulate everything and recreate everything. Um, so that would mean having historic hardware, historic software, proxy service, uh, server, and then you would actually heavily restrict that audience engagement. 
Um, and what they did was then having these very small sized, almost screenshots that were being shared on that Tumblr website. Um, and they're presented on a public website, so you don't have to download that one terabyte. Um, this which then allows easy access. Um, and what he did is that he built a system that then would load those pages in a virtualized and period appropriate hardware and software environment um, and captures them at the original uh, 800 by 600 pixels. So that means that if you go through that Tumblr website, you actually see that the browsers look differently in every single, or not every single, but in a couple of different screenshots, simply because there was a different moment in time that they were created or edited in a sense. Um, and you can also see, if you go through those screenshots that they are, you can distinctly see that it is theirs because their cursor is always in the same place within that screenshot. So it, there's a certain signature to it as well. Um, and then what you can see is if you have this screenshot with that browser, you see the URL, which means you also know which city or which suburb it was in, which is important for understanding that type of content. Um, now the real fun stuff starts. So um, the thing with screenshots is, of course, that they don't move. So they don't blink. You cannot scroll. You don't really see what's going on, because that's the essence of a screenshot. Um, and that's quite limiting to understanding how that type of vernacular looked like. Um, so what they did is they looked at three different websites that were considered the most popular on Tumblr. Um, one is the Divorced Dads page. That's this one. And then there's the Cute Boy site, which is about cute boys, as you can imagine. Um, and then there's I have a website, which is some guy who has a website, and that's also the title of his website. Um, so what he had did is he actually recreated those websites. So this one is entirely online, and you can see how this works, how you can click through it, you can scroll, you have all these nice little effects, everything is kind of, one could say ugly, one could also say exciting. Um, and they become closer to actually how this usually functions when you actually look at these websites, which not all these other systems can properly do. Um, so with this performative distribution on Tumblr, um, this is an obvious note to make, but I think it's an important one, is that Tumblr is of course a microblogging and to some degree a networking or social networking site. So people use it to hang out with others to share and repost, and etc. Um, and then if you look at these posts, you can actually see that this happened. So people are still engaging with this content, although it started in 2014, um, and although Tumblr is not as popular anymore maybe as it used to be. Um, so that is this very simple logic of social media where it really is about engaging, reposting, blogging, um, liking, commenting. Um, and if you, to kind of play on the city of the dead web club, that also then shows that this content is still alive because people are still engaging with it in different ways. Um, and only Alina shared, I mean, it's shared here on the Tumblr, but she also used to share it on her t uh, Twitter account. I think she left Twitter now, but now she's on, on Mastodon. Um, and other people are also actually picking this up on, for instance, Discord server. So you see that users are engaging with this content and they're part of actually circulating it continuously. Um, I think that's an interesting part because when I was looking at this, I was thinking, okay, but that's kind of a nostalgic way of interrelating or relating yourself to content that you may never really have been a part of. Um, and I have to admit that I, for instance, never had a Jewish city's website, so I'm too looking at that as an outsider who was never really one of those users. Um, and I asked this to Lielina with this question, isn't that a form of aesthetic nostalgia? Because aren't we only engaging with things that look crazy to us because we're not used to that aesthetic? Um, rather than really grasping that social context and that like bigger, bigger relation or bigger context of it. Um, her answer was no, <laughs> clearly no. Um, so she was saying it's not per se nostalgic for different reasons. Um, one of it is the fact that these mostly younger people who never had these type of websites, um, they're not really looking at it only nostalgically. So they are actually critically assessing the content and everything was scraped that could be scraped. So that also means that there are websites that are very racist, very offensive in all sorts of different ways. Um, and people are being critical of that. So they're not only saying this was the best of times for the internet. Um, and next to that, these types of websites never were respected from a web design perspective. Um, so as right now and back in the 90s, uh, that type of web design never really was held in large respect by people. So how can you really be, there was never a golden time to, to look back on nostalgically. Um, now we're coming to what I think is a very interesting point, but a tricky point within this project. Um, and that's the fact that Tumblr in itself, of course, is a social media website um, and was even owned by Yahoo um, in 2013 when they bought it. And then they were bought again, both of them, um, by Verizon Communications in 2017. Um, and as probably you know, Tumblr had different problems with actually content management. So, for instance, but there are others. 
Um, in 2018, they banned uh, different nudity and sexual content, and people were very upset that they couldn't share that anymore. Um, and then the archive team started a not safe for work project to actually, again, save and archive all that content that was lost and deleted. Um, one of the possible reasons for that ban might simply be that, a, that they couldn't really have advertisements in the same way, or people felt like they're not very attractive for advertisements if people are sharing that type of content. Um, and that creates this weird paradoxical thing, I think, within the project, because that means that if you host something on Tumblr now to make it accessible for people who are on Tumblr or were on Tumblr in 2014, um, Tumblr may at some point also discontinue that service to some degree. So that instability of the original social media is continued in the social media that is used as a platform to actually share that type of heritage. Um, and that's very clear choice by the artists where they look at um, they're looking at accessibility, they're looking at presentation, they're looking at circulation, and they find it more important than controlled preservation. Um, so another project, part of the Umbrella of Van Terbeid, um, is the research block where they share stuff they found, um, and it can be anything from interviews of people who had these websites, and they somehow trace them down and manage to talk to them. Um, also, simply things they found that they found very interesting that were particular design elements. Um, there are some technical restoration preservation questions that are, that are asked there. Um, for instance, the idea of digital snow, which basically was stuff raining down on the page, but then those images were dying or they couldn't find them anymore, so they become snow. Um, missing images that rain down on, on websites. Um, others were, for instance, the idea of a blingy, so it was an online uh, GIF generator. Um, and they actually started this two years before the Tumblr, so they could Whenever they found stuff in this very large data set, they could immediately reflect on it, write about it, and share it on that block. Um, and then later, the Tumblr came out of that, and they were interrelating, of course. Um, you see them already here on the top of the page. So it's organized with a tagging system that Olia Lina said is very interesting because it's very flexible. They basically make them up along as they're going along, uh, along, and then they can adapt them and create new ones for these different pages or these different posts that they're making. Um, the first one that they ever made was Alive, once again referring to the opposite of the dead web, um, where they thought, where they found different folders of information that they figured must have been deleted because officially the website was down, um, but it was still somewhere hidden on like a different path where they didn't expect it. Um, and specifically, this was on the Japanese GeoCities website, and they had found a folder with clip art that was designed by Yahoo themselves, um, but then was still online later, it was also went offline again. And um, then they have other texts such as ruins. So ruins refers to sites with missing links, dead images, placeholders. Um, the tag meta refers to the process of archiving, uh, restoring, and researching these new cities. Um, that then also includes these technical insights. Um, and I always find this one quite funny. There's the tag torture, um, somewhat unexpectedly referring to how it is a torture to see these websites not fully functioning. Um, so that shows that there's, there is a practical aspect because you organize information, because you index it, but then there's also the aspect of um, these pages and this tagging system being very, very personal and there I would say also quite poetic, um, which means that it could be misinterpreted by other researchers. I think it's worth sure you kind of have to know what it's about to understand it at all. Um, and you kind of need the artist to actually tell you what it's about. So it's not making a system that is useful for every single person who would look at it, um, which also means that it's not really standardizing it in the same way that you would normally do with metadata practices. Um, so the artists have their very important idea within this resource block, with this idea that you need subjectivity to look at internet culture. Um, and they want to move beyond an algorithmic understanding of that internet culture, as you might see on Google today. Um, they do that with these tags, as you see, uh, but they also do it by researching hyperlinks between different websites to understand how people were befriended with others and related to other pages, um, which is not picked up in Google's algorithm, um, and by focusing on these human stories, memories, uh, and histories. Um, so just as the Tumblr, the blog itself is also collaborative, so people can respond, like, comments, etc. Um, and those contributions become also part of the project again because they might inspire a new post, for instance. Um, so this research institute, or the Geocities Institute that they created here, um, foregrounds then human memory um, and leverages the memory of both the artists but also of the uh, memories of the former users in different ways. 
So um, the last part within this large umbrella um, is this idea that they don't only have stuff that is on the internet, but they actually created works too that were in the gallery. Um, this is one example at the photographer's gallery um, where they presented the one terabyte of kilobyte age video show. Um, so these are screen videos of different pages that were running where stuff, as I showed the video before, was blinking, moving around, like it's, it's real, it's alive. Um, and they were presented on this media wall at the photographer's gallery um, in 2013 and 2022. Um, so they're shown in full performance. You see the original browser window, the URL, um, which we're changing every five minutes. They were offline, um, so they're not, it is a screen video. It's not something that is running on the internet. Um, and in a way, there's a similarity with Tumblr where their snapshots, their first impressions, they may invite someone to look further into the project. Um, and it is also, in a way, that trade-off between authenticity and ease of access again, um, where it's not entirely authentic, but it is very accessible um, and becomes this uh, consideration between those two. Um, then this is another one, and this is my personal favorite. Um, that's a diptych that's called Give Me Time, This Page Is No More, uh, between 2015 and it's ongoing. Um, so what they did is they went through this data set again, and they made a selection of two different types of pages. Um, both, again, relating to this narrative of time, where one set are um, websites that they found that are promising future developments. And um, so those are people sometimes say, I'm very busy, I'm going to update this later. Or there's a lot of different stuff of people promising that it might be a, a sad or boring or ugly website right now, but soon it's going to be great. Um, and then there's other types of websites that are more um, about actually doing the opposite, which is announcing their shutdown. So some of these people were very angry at Yahoo and then were saying, okay, I'm out of here. Um, similar to, I think, how a lot of people were doing that on Twitter recently. Um, and others are people who just say, okay, this is it. This is the end of my website and it's now come to die. Um, and what happens is these two pages or these type of projects that are presented next to one another on 35 millimeter slides and are projected onto a wall um, in this installation work. Um, it has been presented at some different places, uh, the new museum, Axioma, art projects, the kitchen. Um, and I think the interesting thing here is that you can really see that this, the hand of the artist, or the eye of the artist is quite clearly there because it becomes this very particular narrative of time that is told through the database um, by juxtaposing this idea of development on the one hand and then the very definitive endings on the other. Um, and by doing that, in a way similar to the Tumblr, um, it creates this temporal dissonance again where um, it collapses these two different understandings of time in relating to the, the dead slash alive web. Um, so I think the fun thing here is this materiality um, because there is this inherent, and this is something only Alina told me, this inherent um, relationship between DS slides and then screenshots. I mean, both of them are quite small, both of them are very static. Um, both of them become almost a small snapshot of something that may have been much bigger or much more complex. Um, there's no movement in it, there's no interactivity in the same way in original websites. So these websites that used to be very dynamic, um, kind of possibly overwhelming or busy or blinking or doing all this stuff, suddenly are archived. It's just an image of something specific. It's memory, it's no longer alive. Um, and that choice then for this analog photography, about the analog medium, um, then also turns this project into this memory device where the, the existential angst of these formal geocities users of their content coming to die is suddenly a reality. Um, one could say that possibly these material slides are actually much easier to archive and much easier to preserve, uh, but you can also almost understand it as an inside joke on how um, it's very important but also possibly very difficult to actually properly archive the internet. Um, then what I think is an interesting concept here to consider is the idea of a network of care. Um, this is something that was brought forward by um, Annette Decker. Um, and she suggested this term of the network of care to talk about um, a network that almost exists organically or comes about organically uh, between experts and non-experts who want to, for, uh, to protect and safeguard internet art outside of institutional context that at a particular moment in time weren't really concerned with conserving net art at all. Um, and what you can see with this project is that these organizations that I mentioned at the beginning, so that's um, Internet Archive, um, Archive Team, Restorative Lens, it's one of those mirrors. Um, then the artists and also continuously the users and even the bots that they invite to become part of their project, that they together form that type of network of care. 
Um, so they don't really have any kind of institutional collaboration, they're not officially affiliated, but they do build on each other's work in different ways and they use each other's data sets and they help each other out. Um, they even refer to their, their other, those others as their friends. Um, so there's some friendly vibes going on too. Um, and so this idea of Decker, on a Decker is that in this network of care, we're not only talking about the technical aspects of archiving, but we're also talking about this importance of preserving social information and relationships. Um, it then applies to this network that is created of organizations, artists, users, and bots that preserve GeoCities as a collection of cultural internet practices, but also of human relationships. Um, I think interestingly, this the fact that it's there, the availability is not per se enough to actually remember something. Um, because you need that organic process to form um, in this network of care, and that's something you cannot really force. Um, there's another example of a Dutch social network that's Hives, um, that I did have a we website myself and I found it, and it's very cringe. Um, and they managed to f save 25 terabyte of that particular website after it's sadly or not so sadly closed down. Um, so that's 25 times even bigger than what they found of GeoCities, but someone, somehow no one so far that I know of has really cared about it enough um, to really actively engage with it. So even though this data set exists, it's not really picked up by artists or other researchers in the same way, simply because there's no interest or spark or something going on. Um, so that really shows that that continuous memory and reinterpretation of GeoCities um, is only possible because so many people took an interest in it and they're passionate about it and they're part of, um, they're actively engaging and preserving, restoring, presenting, discussing and circulating it. Um, so if we then look closer at one terabyte of kilobyte age in the context of what has also been going on with these other organizations, we can see that it's much more of a subjective and even narrative approach to GeoCities as a data set. Um, the other organizations that I mentioned follow the data set more closely, so archive team crawls without any filters, Internet Archive gives access if you know the URL, um, and Restorative Lens presents it according to the city structure. Um, what the artists then do um, is that they also do technical work, but next to that they interpret that data sets by focusing on subjective subjectivities um, and different memories, um, and they present fragments of it in this narrative way through different ideas of time and understandings of time. Um, they're very close to the users and they even create one terabyte almost as a dedication to these users that they hold very dear. Um, we can consider one terabyte as reflecting different levels of ambiguity. Um, so the Tumblr has, diff has um, actually the biggest interpretation surface and can be interpreted and understood in different ways. Um, give me time, the space is no more. The, di the DIA projects or installation work uh, has a much clearer narration because it's material properties, but also this juxtaposition of development and shutdown. Um, and the resource block also because it's written language is, is most clearly articulating the position of the artist. Um, and then the fact that there are these various projects also show or underlines that the artists think that there are different ways of approaching this data set, there's not only one. Um, and the fact that they approach it in all these different projects over and over again also testifies to that. Um, so what I think is a very important takeaway from this particular archival uh, position of the artist versus non-artists or other organizations um, is how they consider um, actually dealing with internet content in general. So in a way, the, the, only, or the only way that they really see fit is to actually engage with that meaningfully, um, or to engage meaningfully with content on the internet, which is a space that is extensive, varied, and impossible to capture entirely, um, is doing so through the experience of the people that were actually involved in its creation. Um, and with doing, or by doing so, they also really say that circulation is then central to that, to that concept and to that approach. Um, so digital archives are already made to be moved around um, in different, and circulate and be reproduced across levels, people, networks, and locations. Um, and one terabyte actually does that by moving between modalities, being online and offline, um, also media, users, and visitors. Um, and by doing so, it builds interestingly on this idea of folklore that says that you can really only reach immortality with a particular idea or a concept or a culture if you make sure that it's permanently being disseminated. So preservation without presentation is then no way to actually remember uh, what is going on or what was going on. Um, whereas the other organizations might emulate the data and the technical strategy, um, and in a very normative understanding, you could say electronic data is already always performed. Um, as a user or as a viewer, you still perceive it to be in one particular place. 
and one terabyte tested differently by actually reperforming that data set right now in the present with other users, uh, both former and possibly new uh, people relating to GeoCities. Um, and by doing so, they reinterpret it and also embrace this idea that actually internet culture is never something static, but it's always continuously in flux. Um, especially the Tumblr is in a very clear idea of what Anna Decker has referred to as the idea of presentation over preservation, and I would even say in this case, circulation over preservation. Um, because the artists said that they don't really want that Tumblr to become an archive. Um, they find it a very important mode of distribution. Um, and they found it, thought it was important to bring that culture to where the users already are or were in 2014, um, where they also mentioned that they would possibly consider moving it to another platform if the time comes. Um, and that's different from what, for instance, the archive team and especially Internet Archive do if, when they say that they're really doing something to keep it for generations to come. Um, I think interestingly here, the fact that they use a commercial platform where they host those screenshots and they further circulate it, um, reverberates this idea of the future instability and uncertainty of that data set, um, especially with the fact that Joe, who has even owned Tumblr, further um, underlines that fear or possible fear of users that their content is at risk of becoming part of an endless cycle of creation and deletion. Um, it might create a certain awareness for people to really think about who's hosting their data, their information and their relationships, um, and to consider other options of connecting online. Um, and then the artists really express, once again, this fact that the circulation is at the core of this heritage of GeoCities. Um, where I, and that is currently on Tumblr, but it might go somewhere else. Um, and I think, interestingly, it doesn't really seem that someone is closing down Tumblr right now, but GeoCities has also shown that can be quite abrupt or even unexpected that these things stop providing their services. Um, the interesting thing here is that because of this network of care that's created throughout these organizations and projects, that if one link does break, others keep it alive because it becomes part of this continuous circulation. So even if Tumblr would be shut down and the Tumblr itself isn't accessible anymore, um, the project is still alive in its other forms and there are still traces of those um, screenshots of those DS in other parts of the internet um, hidden or moved around. Um, and they're still part of, for instance, the work done by these organizations. Um, so in their focus on circulation and narration, the artist prioritizes accessibility over their archival security. Um, and by doing so, they also change this idea of the memory of it or the remembrance of it. Um, and I think an interesting way to consider the distinction between that archival practice of the artist versus the organizations um, is this idea of formal versus informal social memory, uh, which is an idea by Richard Reinhardt and John Ippolito. Um, so they say formal memory is this idea that you preserve cultural objects in a fixed form and you want to maintain historical accuracy. Um, and informal memory is talking about how um, cultural objects are updated throughout time, how they might be recreated, um, and how that actually keeps them alive by migrating, emulating, and reinterpreting it. Um, so that's a very clear distinction between the work by the artists, much closer really fits to this idea of informal memory. Um, versus um, the organizations that are much closer to formal memory. Um, so whereas the organizations want to preserve and give access to what are fixed or even updated um, data sets, um, the artists then allow themselves space for circulation, interpretation, and narration. Um, of course, formal and informal memory aren't mutually exclusive. Um, that's also emphasized through this term of network of care. And these practices of the archiving organizations and the artists do not exist in isolation, but they're rather complementary to one another. Um, and the artists then, in the spirit of folklore, um, accept that data may not be preserved in its fixed form in the long run, um, and rather have a folkloric understanding where memory is foregrounding um, the role of circulations among users. Thank you. Thank you for the for the presentation. Uh, you know, it kind of talks about like kind of like the idea about that web club is about like to 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 distribute and keeping stuff alive and by different forms and different variations. Uh, we're gonna go to some questions. So I'm wondering if we have questions in the audience or we have questions in the stream. Just uh, checking. <laughs> okay. Is there any? We have a question in the audience. Hello. What do the original creators of the GeoCities website say when they are suddenly like exposed in 
an art gallery? Like, isn't it a bit like, also to say, transgressive, like crossing some borders when you suddenly have another public that you didn't intend it in when you, I don't know, because also when you initially created a website in GeoCities, you didn't thought about what the web ones will be and so on. I think no one ever imagined this, yeah. And then you're referring to the users, right? So if yes, someone the says users, the original users yeah. of it. And then yeah. suddenly you're mm -hmm. exposed in a gallery in, in and like in a different context. Right? When you originally created a website on GeoCities, you didn't thought about this particular case, or even you didn't thought about that it will be, you will be archived once. No one thought about that you actually circumvent your own death, like yeah, like what artists constantly do, like to create things in different type of media to overcome death and so on. Yes. So the ordinary user's perspective, actually, what is am I missing here? Yeah, I think it's an interesting one, and I I can't really answer it in the sense that I don't know their original. Yeah, go ahead. No, I weirdly can answer it <laughs> because um, I actually did uh, interviews with Kyle Drake, who is Restorative Land. And he was, I think we had like several, like maybe three hour chats because he talks a lot, but he's lovely. Um, and basically he was telling me that he has got a lot of crazy emails from people who are very angry that they're websites are suddenly public again. Like a lot of people were pretty happy about it. Like, oh, you found something. This is like a little nostalgia trip for me. But there were a lot of people that were incredibly annoyed and threatening to sue him and stuff like that. But obviously, it's their work. He, can, he can't be sued for bringing this up. So yeah, this was something that I noticed. And I thought you might like it. And I think it's a, in a way a similar question with other social media stuff too. I mean, I don't know the, the name on the top of my head, but there was an artist who made paintings out of, I think they were Instagram posts by people, and you could actually see names as well. And some of that stuff is public, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's great if someone turns it into a painting. Um, so I guess it's a very, I guess there are different ways to approach it. I don't know exactly how it works legally versus how people just being upset. And there's another type of ethics that is outside of legal borders, of course. Um, for the f as far as I know, the artists haven't particularly reflected on that themselves. They kind of considered it's out there and also who really cares, but apparently they're not, not everyone is too happy. <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting thing to consider and I guess it's kind of a, in a way, a gray zone to, to different degrees. Any other questions, comments? Don't be shy. <laughs> Thomas Kendall, do you have anything? Oh, we have one here. Sorry. I'm, I'm, my question is, what happens? What is the cost of all storage data? Of this idea of mm -hmm. storaging, and now that with AIs, they are uh, popping out all these ideas of the cost and the contamination and how how can affect us. I guess there are different costs, right? Like, I mean, talking about Tumblr, I think their account is free and you're talking about like a subscription or something, that's one cost and there's the ecological impact of saving a whole lot of data that you don't really need. Um, I do know there's another project um, where someone tried to actually calculate how much emissions is generated by different websites. Um, there's a lot of talking about, for instance, how I mean, Google creates a lot of emissions and then very heavy websites create much more emissions than very static HTML. Um, as far as I know, it's hard to calculate. Um, and I do definitely think that when it comes to archiving, that's something that has to be considered because you don't really necessarily always need to keep everything, especially considering the fact that that takes a lot of space also and a lot of, I mean, it has an ecological impact. Um, so I, I think it's an interesting thing. I'm not sure exactly how it, how, how it works within one terabyte because the data set is already there and they're engaged with it, but they don't necessarily make it much more heavy than it was before. Um, but definitely, I mean, I think by now we're starting to realize that also the internet has an impact and not every, and even every single email has an impact. Um, and it's not only physical stuff that creates emissions. 
Um, so I think it's definitely something that has to be considered by different archival um, professionals. I'm not sure that answers your question, but maybe it's a response to it. <laughs> Got some more questions in the audience. You mentioned um, the aesthetics of those early websites, that everybody could create their own website and choose kind of the thematics and, and, and the geopolitical geological position of those websites were to, to lead Athens or Hollywood. Um, it feels somehow also like a very free way of, of understanding and creating your own website in, in that sense. And the aesthetics, there were no specific rules. If we look backwards, we consider them as ugly or, or outdated. But if that was not like an aesthetical approach back then, how to create a website, it was very free. So how do you see in contemporary terms this, this relationship if nowadays to make websites is way more difficult than back then, feels like, almost. Yeah, I guess there's two things. So if you look at social media, actually it's much more standardized, and that's also part of why it was shut down, is because people moved to, for instance, Facebook, and then Facebook looked kind of clean and more business-like, and it didn't have a crazy leopard background, for instance, that some house profiles did have, and that these websites also could have. Um, so there is this standardization, and I mean Instagram too, for instance, Twitter too, like those have an interface and then you can put your stuff onto it, but you can't change every single aspect of them. Um, so that's more standardized and cleaned up, or you could also say boring, I mean, depending on how you approach it. Um, I guess people can still make their own websites in HTML and make it how crazy, however crazy they feel like, but there is, I guess, a different understanding of professionalization where things are supposed to look a particular way to be considered professional. Um, and then a whole lot of artist websites that are doing the opposite for the sake of it being an artist website. So I guess it kind of depends on where you're looking at within the web um, and what kind of platform for what kind of purposes. Um, and I think there is also a lot of that nostalgia where people purposely try to recreate something that we would now say is that particular kind of crazy aesthetic of that web. So it kind of depends on the, the place where you're looking at um, type of website versus type of social media platform. Um, but definitely considering or comparing GeoCities as an aesthetic, and it's the same for Hives, um, where you could also change like the borders and how that looked like, and you could have Comic Sans and all this crazy shit. Comparing that to today's social media web, uh, web platforms is very different aesthetically and has a very different design. Uh, do we have any questions? Just uh, just check. Uh, do we have any questions in the in the in the stream? Yeah. Um, one of the questions from the live chat is what kind of resources would you suggest for artists that are interested in using archived materials? Um, I would say it depends on the archive material. Um, in the case of GeoCities, all of that is online. I mean, if you get yourself a nice external hard drive, you can actually download that particular terabyte. Um, and I think when it comes to other types, there are a lot of other types of archives and web archives as well. I mean, Archive Team is one of those that actually saved it. So if you want to look at, for instance, a not for safe project, I think all of that is really available. Um, so it's a matter of identifying the right partners and organizations um, and then look at what they have available. Most of it is open source and is freely available. Um, but I can also imagine those are things maybe that you guys have interesting ideas for, um, or maybe not on the top of your head. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, uh, well, I mean, that's kind of like part of the Dead Web pro project is like we want to like uh, check with the world if people have interesting projects that they want to share because a lot of these projects are kind of done by individuals, maybe some groups that are kind of like situated in a certain country or institution or researching by themselves that necessarily have that opportunity to, to talk to the right researchers, organizations, or people. So it's kind of like the idea with Dead Web Club to kind of connect those people and then maybe uh, result in some interesting research and projects into like Hives or Angel Fire or name your local uh, web hosting company <laughs> or social media or music files or MySpace. So that's kind of the idea. Uh, so because if you if you go online it's really hard to like search for a specific topic and find those people because it's kind of hidden under the layer of kind of like knowing the right keywords and knowing how to contact and having the contacts to this and that 
not necessarily everyone has. Uh, I just want to check if you have one or two last project questions. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering if any of you up there uh, have have a personal experience with uh, yeah experiencing the that uh, web and uh, would like to share how you coped with it. Um, yeah, if you were part of a community or had a website or yeah something on the web, and yeah, if your experience it died and it disappeared, and how did you yeah then work it out? Yeah, this is probably me. So um, actually, I graduated from experimental publishing with a project about internet communities and what it kind of fed from my own teenage bored self going on every possible 3D world anywhere. And one of them for me was Habbo Hotel. <laughs> and I don't know how many of you have played Habbo Hotel, but it is, wow, yeah. It's something, but it still exists today in a very, very, uh, let's say, watered down format because it had some, uh, <laughs> some bad press because basically a lot of these worlds, they still exist, or if they don't exist as a mirror, that exists. But the, um, the originals will exist, but not many people are going on them. So I made a new Habbo account in 2022, I think. And I went back into the rooms that I knew so well and <laughs> immediately was enlisted into the Habo Mafia. And I don't know if any of you <laughs> played Habo enough to know that this place likes to replicate very in real world situations. So they have Habo's Next Top Model. They have McDonald's, like fully set up. And then they also have a mafia that is the underground of Habo that controls everything. Uh, but one thing that happened was because less people are going there, sort of people would go there to have very hidden chats. And I know one of the most bad press with Habo was that they found a terrorist cell using a Habo room to discuss plans. So yeah, that's kind of what happens to a lot of these worlds now. A lot of the other ones I would use, like there was a period of time where a lot of big corporations were making online worlds. So Disney made one, Coca-Cola made one. But these guys both shut down because I think they realized there was no money in virtual worlds anymore. Also Flash leaving made a lot of them die. But yeah, it was... Uh, I'd say anyone who ever played Have a Hotel, just go inside again and look at the ghost of it. It's quite something. <laughs> nah, I can't top Have a Hotel. <laughs> uh, it's hard to top Have a Hotel. Uh, well, well, like, uh, for example, I was part of a, a few IRC groups where we had a lot of people discussing music, underground hip hop, for example. There was a bunch of websites documenting this community uh, at the time. This is like the early 2000s. And like basically a lot of that stuff is just, uh, just gone. But the thing that I find really interesting is that the connection that people made online at that time to uh, avatar and, and nicknames still exist. And there's a lot of the communities kind of like the, 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 the spaces doesn't necessarily exist anymore, but the connection still exists in, in real life. But it wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for the virtual uh, situation. And actually some of the IC channels, they installed like a bot and you it would do a specific command. It would give you an MP3 of a specific song. And apparently the bots still are roaming alone on this uh, chat, chat rooms where you can still go in, in there and then you can do different commands and it would give you mp3s of songs and that apparently is still kind of active but kind of talking to, to ghosts in a way. Um, that's kind of, well, you know, it's still the web so, you know, it's like the world of online communities are always kind of changing and, and ebbing and, and flowing around. How comes to mind? Uh, we just want to do, because we need to wrap up, if there are any other questions online, Yes, yes, let's do an online question. Uh, 
Oh yeah, you have a microphone. <laughs> Uh, there's one question um, for the speaker. Uh, they would like to know uh, what your thoughts are on the archiving creativity on the current web platforms today versus GeoCities and HTML evolve constantly and we have seen creative uses of them die such as choose your own adventure games on YouTube and uh, other platforms. Um, and, um, oh, it's very long, sorry. Um, uh, these, yeah, the, these interactive game elements um, are sure to die with the platforms themselves and um, will at one point be lost. And also much love from Slovenia. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess with that kind of stuff, it's even harder because you're talking about stuff that is connected to other things. And what you see with these websites is, even if someone archives, let's say, the storefront of it, um, then there are a bunch of links that are going to external websites that are not archived, and then you end up on a dead link. Um, so with those types of content where there, it's basically built on those links, um, the chances of one of the links breaking and then the whole thing falls apart. Um, so I guess, but I'm and by no means an expert on this, but I guess that it's even more complicated to archive simply because you just have more instability because you have more interrelatedness between contents. Um, so that would be my response on from the top of my head. But then again, I never in depth studied archiving those kind of games. Okay. Um, no, we're just gonna because of, of time. So I just want to thank, uh, really thank like uh, Marijn and, and Dirk and Mitchell for presenting and showing of the work. And thank V2 for the support and pure like, let's do this thing. It's amazing, like Alex over there and uh, Richard's behind the stream and like everyone here. We want to also really thank an idea there for the, for the support. Um, and, and everyone, we also want to thank everyone who had came here to, to V2 tonight. We want to thank everyone at the stream uh, for, for taking the time out and a busy uh, life uh, to, to watch and uh, follow this project we're doing. Uh, if you want to subscribe to our newsletter, there's a QR code on the screen. You can also find any information on uh, deadweb.club. Deadweb uh, uh, one final thing before we go, like I briefly touched on it in the introduction, but um, also, if you have any ideas for some things you want to see in later meetups, talks, like it doesn't always have to be a lecture series. It could literally be like you want to do a workshop on something or something like this. Please feel free to call, uh, not call, don't call me. Um, oh, email us. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, yeah, email us and we would be really happy to chat and maybe think about something we can do. Like this is by no means us dictating what we want you guys to see. It's very open. So remember that. <laughs> but please don't call me. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye.